Welcome to Talking Giants presented by DraftKings. I'm your host, Bobby Skinner, here with my co-host, Justin Pennick, And we have a game to recap. Now, I know we lost, but it's a preseason game, so you don't have to care about the end result. But we are going to talk a lot about the individual performances. Some good, some bad. Things that you should worry about, things that you shouldn't. Things that you should be excited about, things that you should. Justin, how are you? How did it feel to be at the game? How are you doing? Bob Skinner, I think it's preseason for everybody because I think you're supposed to start off these episodes with Jets 12, Giants 7. Welcome to Talking Giants. My name is Bobby Skinner with my co-host Justin Penick. So it's preseason for everybody. Um, it's also preseason for me. I'm sorry for my voice. This is kind of terrible. Would not blame you if you clicked off right now because this is I just going to be bad. Do, don't click off. All right, don't click off. Um, but I'm going to try to not talk that much this episode. It felt good to be back at MetLife. It's first time since end of 2019. It was the first time that Giants fans were allowed in MetLife where Eli Manning was not on the team. Did also realize that, which was a very humbling thing to really feel because I was watching the, the the new hype video that they made for this year, and they had Eli in it, but Eli is now a historical figure. He is not a current player, so it wasn't like he was part of the hype video in that kind of way. So it was good to be back. Um, I, I was expecting more of an uglier game, still a boring game, but just great to have football back and really appreciated uh, everybody that kind of came up and said hello. So happy to be here. How are you? For sure. I'm I'm good. Um, now, I want to talk about this first because I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because it's not like the biggest deal, but I feel like we have to – I don't want to say it for the end either. Clayton Thorson is really bad. I mean, he went 5 for 16, 72 yards, had the one touchdown. Which, by the way, fun fact, Damian Willis has had a touchdown in two of the little Giants' last three preseason games. He had one for the Bengals in 2019. I, I, I just want to get out of the way. I feel like we should have a better third-string QB. One who can just compete in the preseason, not complete less than a third of his passes. That screws up the wide receivers. Like I don't. It's not even like, oh, because we need a good third QB. I just want to be able to have our wide receivers be able to make some plays in the, in the, in the preseason. He had a he had a, a a fastball check down to a covered a covered Sandro Plascomer on fourth and seven, and then his deep balls were just like I'm just gonna throw it up there and see what happens. Yeah, the uh, technically the guy from Cincinnati who you know who he caught the touchdown pass he should have had two touchdown passes or catches. I excuse me, yeah, because Dorson. He was wide open on the right sideline, but Thorson just basically he threw it into the stands. You said that in your in your reaction video on YouTube. I, that's a good point because before this podcast, I was just going to be like, I don't care about Clayton Thorson. You know, he could be as bad as we want or as good. He's probably not making the team because Glennon's the second quarterback. But that's a good point where really the only wide receiver in which we really have a take on is David Sills because he had you know. The, the second or the first most explosive play from that game on the sideline and running that little go route. And he had, it was a really nice catch. That's the only wide receiver that we have a take on. And wide receiver five is a big competition right now. And it could be decided on who stands out in preseason, who stands out on special teams, or a combination of either or. So really, the only take on any wide receiver we have right now is on David Sills. And it's because of how bad Clayton Thorson was. Yeah, it's, it's less to do with like, oh no, what happens if Daniel Jones and Mike Lennon gets hurt? And no. less is like, can we have a preseason game where we can like at least form some opinions out of the second half? I mean, he was brutally bad. Jason Garrett should low-key go in there, you know, probably be a little better, and he could see what it's like to operate within his offense. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> uh, Exper experiential learning, they call that. So... So, yeah. But anyways, Justin, people who could be better than Clayton Thorson, at quarterback, Brent Merrill, Paul okay. Dietz, mm -hmm. Paul, Paul the Dietz, he does the Dietz, and Matt Garnsey. These these last names are like, I don't think I've ever seen these last names. I've seen Merrill, Merrill Hodge, even though that's a first name. I've never seen these last names in the world. Who are these people who can throw the ball better than Clayton Thorson? They definitely 100% can throw the ball better than Clayton Thorson because they went to patreon.com slash talking giants. And for $2 a month, you can be a talking giants patron. I think, I think it's a pretty cool thing. Pretty big community, very close, tight knit community too. There's a group, there's a group chat if you get in the YouTube group chat, and you know I think uh, you can kind of be welcomed in there. Patreon.com backslash Talking Giants. You get some fun perks. We're recording on a Saturday, a, a Sunday after the preseason game. Bobby, the next two weeks, Sunday preseason games, we're recording 
after the game because we want to have the podcast out on a Monday and we will be live streaming to our Patreon crowd. So patreon.com backslash talking giants. Thank you to our patrons. Right, right. All right. So let's talk about what actually does matter. The offensive line and where we can have some real opinions off of it. And I do think there's a fair share of bad and good with it. The Giants starting offensive line played three snaps minus Shane Lemieux because obviously, he, you know, they're taking it easy with him coming back f- uh, from from that injury. Interestingly enough, the probably the top two backups didn't play in Jonathan Harrison and Nate Solder, but they did play three reps. And I want to talk about Matt Parrott first because Matt Parrott, we, you end up talking about the same things over and over again in an offseason because there's only so much things you can say about one team. And Matt Parrott has been a big topic of discussion, especially for me. And a lot of like this offensive line swings on him. It's like I I, I trust a- Andrew Thomas. I trust Nick Gates. I know Will Hernandez isn't great, but he's got a nice little baseline. Even if Shane Lemieux is bad, I don't think him being bad should doom the offensive line. Matt Parrott could, and I feel worse. What's up, police? I feel worse about Matt Parrott coming out of the game than I do going in because because of that sack. Like that sack was what his issue was: opening his hips too early. And not punching. And it led to a very quick sack. Sacks happened, but that was a very quick sack. And he did bounce back well. So it's not, this isn't like, oh my gosh, we're doomed. But I am a little worried because those are some of the issues. And hopefully we don't face, you know, week one is is Bradley Chubb and Vaughn Miller. Like he didn't, he didn't show anything to say like, hey, those guys may not have a stat pad game for themselves versus Matt Parrott. Like that, that is my worry. And if he is bad, then that is a huge issue. It's it's a much bigger issue than Shane Lemieux being bad uh, at pass blocking. And and we talked about Shane Lemieux last week. He he has a path to be at least an average um, pass blocker, where Matt Parrott can be a great one. But it like I am a little worried about that. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Because it's tendencies. Now you can spin it in two ways. I can see somebody spinning this into Matt Parrott and saying, "Well, Matt Parrott." putting on tape early some of the struggles that he had coming out of college, hey, that's kind of a good thing because we knew about it and it's something that can be fixable, right? Versus a new issue. Versus a new issue coming up and it's like, well, damn. Well, we didn't know Matt Parrott had this problem. So the fact that it's on tape consistently, if we're seeing it, that I'm confident in Rob Sale, Joe Judge, and the coaching staff, Freddie Kitchens also seeing it. And like, hey, this is something that we can remedy, and this is something that we can correct. So I get what you're saying, but it's also kind of flipping the optimistic side of it there too. Yeah, and I saw some people say that it looked like Devontae Booker was supposed to chip. I just can't – If, like I said, if it was something that we hadn't seen uh, – uh, you know, from Matt Parrott going back to UConn, I would be he like, got okay, beat. that makes sense. Yeah, he got, he, beat, he got beat on that rep. And – now, again, he did bounce back, but, you know, they had 10 real pass, you know, blocking reps, you know, t- or 10 throws. I I, can't, I didn't count one because it was a screen pass. So, but let's say 11. Well, if you do that, you know, that one sack for every 11, you know, passing plays, well, you're the second worst sack team in the NFL again, yeah. you know, and, and, and then like numbers wise, not just, you know, speaking out of my ass, like numbers wise, that you'd be the second worst team, uh, sack team in the NFL. So Parrot, he can definitely, you know, fix it. But it is a little worrisome that you saw that from Matt Parrott. Um, but it was it was nice to see him bounce back though. Like he had a pancake mm-hmm. on the next play. The good thing about him is you never have to, like you don't have to worry about him as a run blocker. Like he is a good run blocker. The offensive line unit as a whole, besides Wiggins, like they were very good run blocking wise. Booker had three for twelve. You know Clement was averaging over six yards per carry. We're gonna talk about those guys individually later. So we can um, we can talk Wiggins. And some bad, but then there there is like some pretty good positives from the offensive line too, though. Yeah, absolutely. They the first series was definitely shaky, but offense first starting offensive line played three series, Bobby, and they looked a lot better. They settled down the the after the for after the two after the first series, which even if the Jets were starting to alternate some of their backups in there, Quinn and Williams was still in there by that third series. So I'm not going to consider them all backups and like, Oh, well, of course the giants uh, first offensive line, they did well against the jets backups. You know, first series was definitely their starters, but I'm glad that they settled down because that at least when you leave with the good impression, it's better than leaving with a bad impression. And they had a very bad impression to start the game. These next two weeks, I feel like are going to be huge for them. Not even just the preseason games, but I'm excited for them to experience 
other talented pass rushers and other talented defenses besides our own because we're going to Cleveland and we'll be going to New England. I'm excited for the for these two weeks for the for the offensive line. And that's important, and that's another thing, you know, on on the positive side of the Matt Pierce. Like, you know what? They haven't played a live real rep in eight months, you know? So, it's you know, you got, like, it was good to see him bounce back. Um, the Giants' edge group is not very good competition, especially with the way they've been, you know, no. guys have been missing practice. Like, it's been very <laughs> bad competition in practice. So, you get some guys out there who are, you know, different than what you're seeing every day. So, yeah. you know, it's not doom and gloom, but, it like, it is worrisome. Like, I, yeah. you can't say it's not worrisome with Matt Parrott. Let's talk about Kenny Wiggins, and then we'll talk about the positives, get, get the neg- you know, let's get the negative stuff out of our system. He can't be the first guy off the bench. He's bad, and it, he's, he's slow. He gets bull rushed. His hands aren't there. He, he is just not good. He cannot be the first guy off the bench. And if Kyle Murphy didn't get hurt, I'd probably be saying he needs to play over Kenny Wiggins. Hell, you could even say Chad Slade, which, you know, that's not even a positive spin on Chad Slade. That's just – Kenny Wiggins can't be the first guy off the bench. I don't know if it's uh, Larson who they signed on Friday. By the way, he's, he's got just an old face, which is kind of funny. He looks like the oldest member on the – he actually might be the oldest member on the team. So, you know, obviously Shane – but he, he just can't be the first guy off the bench. He can't be. He's, he is not good enough to be the first guy off the bench. He's very slow. He can – if he plays like that – he will wreck games. And he was doing it up against like the second and third stringers too. Yeah, the crazy thing is is that Kyle Murphy got hurt and then Kenny Wiggins comes in because there's such there's zero offensive line depth we have right now. And then he gives up more sacks and he gives up more pressures, which was absolutely bizarre. It just looked like his feet were in cement, Bobby. It really I mean, it just looked like his feet were in cement and not even Like his body was leaning forward and, you know, his feet were just stuck. Everything was just so slow. I mean, that is the perfect way to describe it. It looked like the speed of the game was too fast and his body was just too slow. It was just really, really bad. And I think you're right about Ted Larson being the oldest giant, maybe not counting special teams if there's a special teamer that's older. Yeah, Bobby, Joe Judge did say uh, luckily on Sunday with on the conference call that they are going to explore offensive line depth no matter what, which is good. There's a good chance. Well, I I say a good chance, meaning yes, like that it, it is going yes, to happen. Joe Judge saying there's a good chance is like saying is, is saying yes, we're going to yes. have somebody this week. That's also like a no shit Sherlock type of comment too. And if Clayton Thorson is you know to kind of maybe to cap off the really negative points of this pod, Clayton Thorson, if he does have some sort of extended injury timeline, then they will be exploring the QB market for a QB three for this preseason as well. So bring back Alex Tanning, get him off the Eagles coaching staff, poach him. Uh, Kyle Oletta had a good game for the Browns, which was kind of funny. <laughs> and didn't sure. Davis Webb do well too, which is I, crazy. I'm not sure to be honest. I didn't. I didn't watch that one. Yeah. Um, good things on the offensive line. Will Hernandez looked really good. Yeah. Run and pass like. Now I know some, you know, he didn't get faced with a ton of stunts or anything or anything meant, you know, mental. But you look at reps, and he is the guy stonewalling the line scrimmage. He's mirroring. He's got the pass, you know, blocking ability. He had two really good pulls. He was moving guys in the run game. Will Hernandez, he lost weight. It's a position switch. It's his last year in this contract, and you know, I think a little people were worried from that clip um, that went viral from the fan fest. Uh, where it's like he just totally missed the, you know, uh, Tay Crowder. But he looked good, man. That is very encouraging. And that's someone who we know who can be good. Like, it's, you know, sometimes it takes a little longer for guys to develop, you know. I mean, this is a totally different example. But Garrett Bowles, I mean, he was a bust of a first-round pick. Now he's like an all-pro left tackle for the Broncos. So, like, and I don't want to overreact too much on the positive here either. But Will Hernandez looked really good, man, and it was nice to see that. Yeah, especially not knowing where he exactly was at and to see him the first time with our own eyes to see him do really well is absolutely a positive. Going from last season where we didn't know if it was COVID or it was something else and thinking, well, he's back, so it's not COVID and is there something off the field that we don't know? And then we learned over the offseason, yes, it kind of was COVID. So seeing him out there for the first time fully Getting substantial reps uh, was definitely a positive. And again, going forth into Cleveland, going forth into New England, the practices are going to be big for him, and they're going to be big for all these offense alignments. So good on Will Hernandez. And and Will Hernandez wasn't even someone I was worried about because I do think 
Will Hernandez has a baseline of a starting offensive lineman, and I know you know he hasn't lived up to the pick thirty um, pick thirty four hype. But he, like I do think like you put him on most offensive lines in the league, maybe not the Browns, but most offensive lines in the league, like he starts, you know, and he's not like this huge, you know, uh, glaring issue. He's gonna have bad plays, but he's gonna have, you know, he's he's gonna he's gonna have a baseline. So that was good to see. Now I want to get a little nerdy on ask Andrew Thomas because he he did look good, and I'm know? gonna agree with you. He he looked okay. He looked good. Like there was one play where he totally tosses a guy. It was beautiful, but I'm going to, I'm going to nitpick because he's the fourth overall pick and I love him and I have high, high expectations for him. His issues to start 2020 was he wasn't trusting his athleticism at all. Like he was over, he was getting back too quickly. He was oversetting, you know, that with some leaning and stuff and he was getting beat inside and he fixed that. I almost think he's trusting his athleticism a little too much and like and he was washing like Carl Lawson and the other guy around the pocket at like ten yards, which is a win. It is a win. But I think he's good enough to not always have to wash the guy around. And, and on when there was a three step drop, like that's fine. But you wash a guy around at ten yards, that's a win most times. But sometimes it can lead to a sack, and it did versus Arizona, you know. And it was it because guys were up and you know being pushed back in the pocket, and the QB couldn't step up. Yeah, but if you went out on the edge, that's not an issue. Um, so I, I, it was good. They were good reps, but I didn't think they were all great reps. So, and and again, it was the first preseason game. He hasn't been playing against good edge production. So I think this is, this will be good teaching tape where it's like, Hey, good job, man. Confidence. Good. But here's what you could do a little better. They're also doing some, uh, new stuff with him where he's dumping his guys hands down. Like he has put, he is like slapping their hands down, which is getting guys off balance. And then washing around, yep. and I think that's, I think that is specifically for the three step drop. So that's some good stuff. He's learning some new stuff. You know, wasn't leaning like crazy. wasn't You know, wasn't lunging. Um, his his feet look really good. That's what I will say. His feet look really good. So I think we should be excited for Andrew Thomas. Some stuff to work on. Some stuff to get better at, which there should be after the first preseason game. But I, I'm very excited for him. But I want him. I want him to do better, man. I have I have greatness as my expectation for Andrew Thomas. I thought it was good. Um, there was some greatness, and again, like he tossed it, dude. Like that was a beautiful rip. It was fun. I mean, the dude got up and he's like looking around where the play is. Like that's how <laughs> that's how much Andrew Thomas tossed him. And moving guys in the run game, he looked good. So very excited for Andrew. Like um, it feels good to be able to critique a good performance out of Andrew. Yeah, the fact that he tossed the dude in pass pro and it wasn't just in the run game, I, that was really, really cool. I'm going to agree with your nitpick because sitting in the stands and also rewatching it too from the perspective that, because I have my old 22 view, I love it. I love my old 22 vet back. I feel like I can see so much sitting in section 315. But there were three plays straight, Bobby, where guys beat him around the edge. And I, I maybe that's the wrong way to phrase it, but... It's not, it's, it's their... I don't know how you would phrase it. It's not. I wouldn't say beat because that sounds he like he lose, lost the rep. He didn't lose the rep, correct? But yeah, he was. Guys ran around him, and I guess that's the very rude. But at ten yards, which isn't a bad play, right? But still, I'm I'm looking at that. I'm like, that's not a that's not a great great play, and kind of relying on your athleticism, like you said, a little a little too much there. Because when you do get guys like Von Miller um, week one, those guys are going to beat you off the edge, and they are going to win those reps, versus now those guys aren't going to win those reps. So um, it was ni- great. It's nice to critique Andrew Thomas in a very, very good performance, like you said. But I did see that, and I was a little bit more worried in the stands versus then watching replays afterwards. Nick Gates, he had one nice rep where he just finished a dude. Um, n- nothing special outside of that. Nothing bad. Yeah. The run blocking looked good as a unit. Um, backups on the offensive line. Jake Burton, the UDFA out of Baylor, is bad. If the, Ooh, that's if, that's the only UDFA that we did not like. And I mean, I I know we only signed three, but he is a guy that we were just like not no bueno. Yeah, and if they weren't so thin, I think he would be one of the five cut, and maybe still, but like. You know, there's gonna be a there's a sack of credit to Brett Heggie. It was Jake Burton's fault. Like it was it was a method. How did that happen? How did the how did the center get accredited when the left tackle gave it up? 
He was he was the right guard. Oh, look at that. Bad guy. Who, who are you thinking of? You're thinking of Jackson Barton? I have gotten them confused constantly. I do Jackson, too because they're numbers. I, I thought Jackson Barton was going to wear 70, but he's not. Um, so was he was bad. bad. The backups, Murphy got hurt. Slade didn't look great at right tackle. Um, they had that slide protection call, and Alfred Morris just didn't go to the right. Oh, way. yeah, that was bad. I don't know if that was the center. I mean, the backups, the backups with no Jonathan Harrison and and Nate, and Solder. Nate Solder is really bad. You know, so those guys should be better. But right now, if a go- if Shane Lemieux or Will Hernandez would they go down? I don't know if you put Harrison at guard and leave. You know, like it. But long story short, is I feel like you'd have to put some combination of Harrison and Gates. However, you want to do that. I would rather move Gates to guard. And Harrison at center, then play Kenny Wiggins, which like is Kenny so Wiggins unfortunate. Is, he is just not, he is not up to it. He's not up to. He cannot be the first guy off the bench. I usually don't like to predict things like this, but I mean the Giants are going to have to be active once the rosters go down to fifty three. They're going to have to be active, and I really, really hope they have to be. They have to be watching film of every single preseason game and calling whoever they need to call across the NFL with the, with the relationships that they have, finding out who borderline offensive linemen are that are performing well. I mean, that is that is a priority that has to be happening, and they have to add somebody after when the rosters go down to fifty three. Maybe even this week when the rosters when the when the rosters are are cut down by five, they're going to bring somebody else in from another team. They have to. I bet you could bet on it, too. Like, will the Giants add someone else? And everyone's favorite time of the year is right around the corner. College football season. To celebrate, DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top-rated sportsbook app, is putting new players in the center of the action with $200 in free bets. Instantly, if you bet $1 or more on any college football game, take advantage of this limited-time offer now. You heard right. DraftKings is giving all new players $200 in free bets instantly when you place a bet of $1 or more on any college football game, no matter what. Head to the DraftKings Sportsbook app now to check out all the great promotions and daily odds boosts that they are offering. DraftKings Sportsbook is safe, secure, and reliable, located right here in the United States, so it's easy to deposit and withdraw your money at your convenience. Download the, the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use promo code JOHNBOY to receive $200 in free bets when you place a $1 bet on any college football game. That's promo code JOHNBOY to get your free $200 in free bets instantly for a limited time only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Must be 21 or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only. New customers only. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sports for details. Gambling problem? Call 100 Gambler in Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. One thing or two things. One of the Giants podcasts talks about the offensive line for 20 minutes. Second of all, how did Brett Hagee look? Not great, but not like horrid either. Like okay. there were some plays where Brett Hagee, like Jake, or not Jake Burton and Kenny Wiggins screwed him. Fair, because right, yeah. that's the last guy that we didn't talk about. Yeah, it, it was nothing, no, nothing that will goes like you know. Brett Heggie might make this roster, which I never really thought he would this year, anyways. Yeah, let's talk about the big winners. Carter Coughlin. Oh yeah, Carter Coughlin is the biggest winner of this Ooh. preseason game for the New York Giants. He played twenty four reps, his first time playing inside linebacker in the NFL. He played twenty four reps, had five tackles, one strip sack, and one tackle for a loss. And those aren't just empty stats. I mean, he looked good doing it, Justin. We talked about, hey, this guy plays fast. He plays aggressive. He plays quick at the edge. Does he do it at inside linebacker? And he did immediately. And, I mean, you guys know I have a type with inside linebackers, and that is my type. Like, I don't care if you're not the biggest guy. And so, again, he played aggressively, instinctually, was at the ball. You know, he had that tackle for a loss, like, essentially when he came right in the game. And with that edge, like, experience, he got that sack. Like Patrick Graham's gonna use this dude, man. Like, like I don't. I'm not saying he he jumps up to number two next to Blake Martinez, which maybe isn't the craziest thing to say. At some point, maybe he does win that, but he is gonna be used, especially on third down, because he can play like a, he can play that inside linebacker role. You could use him as a pass rusher. He looked decent in coverage. wasn't You know, he wasn't put in man. There was one mistake he made that I I want to talk about, and it was the mistakes that I always say. Okay. Especially if you're a young guy, new at the position. If you're going to make a mistake, make it at 100 miles per hour. And it was on a third down, and his read was, if the running back goes out for a route, you're in man coverage. If he stays in, blitz. And he he blitzed. The running back got past him and ran a route, and he he got there late. 
So it was a bad play. So I'm not praising a bad play, but that's what I want. I want, if you're going to make a mistake, make it like that. Don't make a Devontae Downs mistake where you're just sitting and shuffling your feet and everything's happening behind right. you and you're allowing a big play. But even if you do what's right, you're not making a good play. So he is like that Kyle Van Noy type player mm, you took for, my point. for the Patriots. Like that is, and I remember listening to an interview with Kyle Van Noy when he played for you know Detroit when he started his career. He's like, they didn't know how to use me. They didn't know how to use me. And then I go to New England and they start using me in this in this certain way. So I, I mean, I'm excited for him. Like he looked, and it was his first time playing it too. It was his first time playing that spot, and he looked like a natural. Yeah, look, he's been playing it for years. And uh, I'm gonna give a shout out to two people. Giants Alliance uh, put out a put out a video where he was. Um, uh, playing middle linebacker at high school. So I he was know, actually high school football film. I love it. Uh, yeah, it was great. It's a great job. And then Art was the one who brought up the whole, you know, Kyle Van Noy thing, which I'm like, oh, that's actually really interesting. And, you know, because I want Kyle Van, um, Kyle Van Noy, I want Carter Coughlin to keep that part of his game, which he had at Minnesota, which is that pass rusher mentality off the edge. Well, also, I guess if the Giants see him as this off-ball linebacker, like the best of both worlds, and the best of both worlds is that Kyle Van Noy role. Bobby, uh, Carter Coughlin looked like the best football player on the field last night for the New York football Giants. When he was out on the football field, he looks like the best football player. That That is a factual statement, correct? Yeah, he played in the second half, so that makes sense. No, you know. but uh, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, and you got to take it with a grain of salt, but tackling. That is also the main thing, too, where you're playing a different position and the way that you have to come up and make a tackle is very different from, I think, the middle linebacker spot, interior linebacker spot versus outside linebacker and edge. Wrapped up, bit the ball, got low, lower man wins. He understood leverage in that regard. And while also having the vision in the run game of shedding blockers, getting past the tight end, getting past an offensive lineman that's moving up to the secondary level, and then making a nice sound sound tackle on the ball carrier, looking comfortable and like he's been playing that position for years, like you said. So, loved it. Like, I was ready to even just make a selfie video from the stands and just saying his name because he was just so fun to watch. I know everybody likes Sills and everybody likes the offensive plays, but Carter Coffin was the most fun part of that game last night. He was, he was the Giants' winner of the night. Um, I mean, the inside linebacker group, I, I feel good about it as a whole. Yeah. Right now, I mean, you obviously Blake Martinez is Blake Martinez. Reggie Ragland looked good; like he had a, that big hit on third down, uh, had some nice tackles. So he, you know, he lo- he looked good, and you know, he missed a, you know the start of camp, you know. So I didn't know what to expect out of Reggie Ragland. Was he going to look like he was in shape and and you know able to move around well? Tay Crowder had a bad play where he missed a tackle and he missed it pretty badly, but yeah. He he looked all right, you know. He he's not meant to be that that you know that Mike linebacker to be honest. I thought he, I thought he looked good. Besides that one play, he was really really active and really being aggressive, and he was flying around. It was that one play where I thought it was a bigger play. It was only a seven yard gain, um, but still. And also a note on the type of offense that the Jets run. You know, the Jets they're coming from the the Shanahan and 49er mentality of outside zone. One of the things that we saw last night is the importance of tackling cornerbacks in this, in this really in just in defenses in general, but particularly in this Patrick Graham defense, where if you are playing a team that does outside zone, having cornerbacks that don't give up a lot of depth and can make plays like within that five to four, three yard range of you don't really want to allow much more of those bigger chunks in the run game. And those corners didn't do an awesome job with that. So that's why it's important. I'm excited. You know, I think Bradbury does an all right job. Definitely Aaron Robinson is pretty physical in that regard. It's a good it's important to have safeties. So that can do that too. That was also just another note. About yeah. football. The big winner on offense. We already talked about offensive line. I think it might have been Will Hernandez, but we already talked about offensive line. Even though he left a little on the bone, though. But David Sills Army has to be feeling good. Like he has Three catches for 49 yards, so was by far the biggest performer on the offense. You know, like, I think Clement had 36 yards, and he's he's getting handoffs. David Sills was, you know, he had the most yards on the team, plus a 17-yard pass interference penalty that got them down in the first and goal, and then Corey Clement fall, like, uh, fumbles the ball on the next play. So, I mean, he, he's got that outside release, man, and he knows how to position his body to get contested catches. He's never going to burn anyone. He had the curl route. Like, he looked... Good, but I will say he left some on the bone. He had a drop on third down on the slant, 
Like you make that catch, and then the following play, the the fade over Corey Ballantyne, wasn't the easiest catch, but David Sills should make that catch on Corey Ballantyne, especially fighting for the roster. So I definitely think David Sills, uh, the offense was so bad that David Sills probably has the best night, but they did leave a little on the bone. But I think overall you can feel good about like the David Sills momentum. Yeah, because what is David Sills going to offer you? And I'm saying this almost as like a challenge and maybe a little bit of a critique too, but what is David Sills really going to offer you besides the contested catch? I don't know if he's going to really offer you that much more. And it's because he's he would be wide receiver five versus a guy like John Ross. I really want to see John Ross last night. He was listed as kick returner one on the, on the very early depth chart. That may not matter. It was fun to see David Sills though because it's been – Two years of people kind of hyping him up and saying, this guy's going to be good. This guy's going to be good. You know, keep an eye out for him. Keep an eye out for him. And then injury prevented ever seeing him last year. Well, there was even no preseason. So it was good to just get him out there and get excited over him making a, making a big play. That was a really good catch. The The catch that he did make was a really, really good catch. I didn't really, think he was really going to make it. I didn't think he was going to make it. I thought it was going to be over overthrown by him. Yeah. Um, which, you know, which would have been the theme of the night for Clayton Thorson. Um. But yeah, I mean, and that, that was a good catch. He's he's got that outside release down. Like he is good at that. Um, I just, I do still think it's going to be tough for him to make the roster. Yeah, because I agree. there's five guys who I think are firmly ahead of him, and our three starters: Kadarius Tony and John Ross. Like I don't think this team is looking to cut John, like John Ross. No. Um, and then it's between him, Pettis. CJ Board, who they're using a lot on special teams. Sills can play special teams, not return or anything, but like he was a gunner at West Virginia. But they're using Board a lot, so I just I think we're going to be heartbroken a little bit on on the the fifty three man cut down day because it's going to yeah. be it's going to be a tough road for him to make the roster. Like he has to yeah. really show out and then some. Another winner who we didn't really talk about um, before the show, but I guess we'll talk about him now. And I'm. I'm going to talk special teams. It was wild to see Cam Brown as a gunner. Wild. See, I didn't even pay attention to that. It was crazy to see an edge rusher wearing a linebacker. You know he didn't play a defensive rep, right? No, and Joe Judge said don't read into that. They wanted to evaluate him on special teams. Bobby, every single – I feel so nerdy right now, and I actually hate myself that I'm breaking down special teams. Every single punt, which the Giants were punting a lot, Every single punt, Cam Brown was down there. And, you know, even if a guy calls a fair catch, guy that's standing right in front of him is Cam Brown. And he's ready to make a tackle and he's ready to, you know, pick up the ball if somebody fumbles or something like that. He has the speed, clearly, to get down there. But also why it's cool to see an outside linebacker edge rusher out there besides a wide receiver or a cornerback who they're usually gunners or safeties. He has the strength. He has the strength to get by guys and get past, you know, those guys that are in front of him if they're blocking him. And as a gunner, you get through him. And if he has the speed to chase guys down, then he has the speed to do that. So that was really cool to see Cam Brown there. And, you know, he if there was ever a doubt, I, I hate to do this, but if there was ever a doubt he wasn't going to make the roster, I think last night showing how he could be a really good gunner, um, one game, but I think he did a really good job. He's the top returning special team com- contributor on the team because Nate Ebner's not on the roster. He had the second yeah. most special team snaps. There I can't believe we just did a special teams winner. And it was... I hate that. Um, <laughs> oh, one other thing. Can you read the ad? I'm going to go use the bathroom real quick. Oh, go use the bathroom, Bobby Skinner. So today's episode, winners, actually that segment. Here, we've never done this on Talking Giants before. That segment of preseason winners was sponsored by our friends at Manscaped, the leaders in below the waist grooming. It's back to school time. We want to make sure you pack the essentials to have the best year yet. I had a bunch of college kids come up to me during the tailgate and during, you know, during Fan Fest as well. So if you're a college kid and you know what, you maybe want to have some fun on some Friday and Saturday nights, our buddies at Manscaped, they have some great products. Manscaped, fourth generation performance package. It's just that. It is the package that you need to get ready for night on the, night out on the town. Things are opening up. Be ready for whatever is in the daily schedule for you. It's perfect perfect package for your package and includes the brand new lawnmower 4.0. Fells, go for the Vale Dictorian. Another penis joke. 
of the ball trimming and join the 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by going to manscaped.com and using the promo code GIANTS. Uh, one of the things that I need, I need the weed whacker to chop your worst weeds on the top of your nose and ear. I'm notorious for having some nose hair. Weed whacker is also waterproof, uses 9,000 RPM motor, powered 360 degree rotary and dual blade system. Nose and ear hair trimmer provides propriety skin tape, skin safe technology, which helps prevent nicks, snags, and tugs in those delicate holes that are my nose so get 20 percent off plus free shipping with the code giants at manscaped.com 20 percent off with the code giants at manscaped.com this year graduate with a degree in clean balls with manscaped all right thank you thank okay. you manscaped thank you for the awkward pause so i think we're doing this as a new segment for preseason games because we are like you know in the regular season it's like let's talk we talk about the offense first and then the defense the rookie. Well, we're going to talk about the rookies each game. You know, we talked a little bit about Heggy and Burton, there, but they're UDFAs. Only two of the draft picks played. You know, Kadarius Tony didn't play. Aaron Robinson's not even practicing. Ellerson Smith didn't play, and Gary Brightwell um, didn't play. So it's Aziz Ojolari and Rodarius Williams. And Aziz, he had run really good play. Like, Mekhi Becton, and this is this was kind of Aziz's little issue Anyways, is he can get beat on that first punch in the run game, but Mekhi Becton's going to do that to everybody. But we, I mean, we all saw the play, so I don't need to break it down too much. Where he disengaged, like uh, Mekhi beats him on that initial punch. But one of Mekhi, and I've watched every snap of Mekhi Becton like twice in his NFL career. One of his issues is he wins that first punch, but he doesn't really like keep his feet moving and, and finish the block sometimes. But Aziz disengages, and what he does really well, something that we love about him. He dips down, he gets low, and he gets down that line from his quick and makes a nice run stop. That was a be- that was a beautiful play for Aziz Ojolari. That was like teach tape for Aziz Ojolari. So that play was awesome. As a pass rusher, he didn't do anything. I mean, he only had like four, like four or five, like real pass rush reps, but he he didn't like make any impact at all. Now again, he's going against Mekhi Becton, uh, but he 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 didn't he didn't do anything. But it was only five. You know, he only played two and a half series basically. Yeah, I was intentionally watching him very early because knowing that he was one of the only starters on that front seven that was really out there playing, and he was getting blown off the ball. He was getting blown off the ball, and my worry about Aziz, my main worry about Aziz, which we didn't really expand upon in his PPP, which is tomorrow, but I've expanded upon it before, is his play strength. The fact that the dude is just so young, you know, he, he was 20 when we drafted him. He's 21 years old now. The dude is so young, and, you know, he is a raw pick. I don't want to—he's not a developmental pick because I think he is the best pass rusher on the Giants. He was the best speed rusher out of this draft class. But still, the play strength definitely is a question, and it may prevent him from being this three-down player, which he will develop into. I'm pretty confident he will. But Lorenzo Carter, he has that strength. So— you let let a guy like him get in there, a, a Fetty Odenabo, which he, we I, I want to talk about him a little bit later too. He may have that strength, so it was good to see Aziz out there with the ones, and they clearly feel good about him. But the play strength definitely is a question in terms of him getting bullied at the point of attack. Yeah, at the same time it was Mikai Becton. Like Mikai Becton yes. does that to everybody. Like, and I'm, I'm like, I just said it too minutes ago, but I've watched every snap of his in the NFL twice. Mikai Becton does that to everybody. So I. I I didn't look at that and be like, oh, no. Like, you know. Like, the other person that it happened to with Aziz was Evan Neal, who's probably going to be the top tackle in next year's draft. You know, yeah, so. and there is a 100-pound weight difference there, too. So Yeah, and I like that he <laughs> I like that he knows that he's not going to just, like, just set the edge, set the edge strong against Mekhi Becton, that he does disengage, that he, like, has the instincts to get low and rip through that play and make a stop. Like, cool. Uh, cool, Mekhi, you, you, you had the initial punch. But guess what? I set the edge and made the stop. There you go. So uh, I, I like that from Aziz. Rodarius Williams had a, a tough night. Part of it was them playing such off coverage, but you know Rodarius Williams stops the big play. Like that was that was like the best thing about him from Oklahoma State. It's like when you try and go deep on this guy, it's just not going to happen. Um, so he did stop the big play. Like Rodarius Williams didn't get burnt, but he was allowing stuff underneath. Yeah. Part of that is preseason scheme. But part of that was, you know, Rodarius Williams. It's 
maybe pump the brakes on him being a contributor year one. How many? I got him. I mean, he played Bobby. He played twenty two snaps lined up in the slot, which he's not but really it, a it, slot corner. Oh, wait, that, hold on. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I, I wanted to say that yes, he did play the slot, but his a lot. He gave up catches from the outside. You know, it wasn't like he just like he was fine on the outside and then on the inside. It was different, but that was interesting. Like they, you know, the beat reporter said he hasn't been practicing there. Thirty four snaps outside, and then I think a couple in the box. I mean, Bobby. I mean, that's thirty four plus twenty two. Quick math is fifty six. That's most of the defensive snaps. So they played him for most of the game. I mean, he was unfortunately allowing catches like in the first quarter, and then he was also like allowing catches in the fourth quarter. He allowed eight catches on on ten targets for ninety nine yards and one pass breakup. So yes, he did not allow the big play. Um, which is good. That is what we really in the NFL, you don't want to allow the big play, but getting beat consistently like that wasn't the best thing to see. But also at the same time, corners are going to struggle and we expect, especially young corner. Well, he's not really young. He's 25, but young corners, young rookies to struggle. I'm kind of glad that he's getting this experience instead of it being in regular season when things actually matter and your confidence is just dwindling, get out there you practice very well. You know, you still have that pedigree behind you. It's not like you're getting your ass kicked in practice all week. You have that pedigree behind you of good practices. You got beat in the game a little bit on some outside, you know, on some out routes and stuff like that. Get better. And I kind of like that Rodarius struggled a little bit so he can have that on tape and they can get better from there. Yeah, I don't think you saw anything where it's like, uh oh, this guy is never going to be a contributor. But I do think you should I do think there was a lot of Rodarius hype because of the practice reports we were getting. I do think that it's like he's not going to be a good player year one, at least not the first half of the season. But like I, I am, like I don't think Rodarius is going to come in and yeah. be better than a, like if if it's who's going to play if this these players got hurt who starts the next game Isaac Yadam or Rodarius Williams I'd probably go with Isaac Yadam. Yeah, and think about our cornerback situation right now. Isaac Yadam was playing in like the second the second quarter with our second string defense when he was our number two corner last year. So that makes you feel really, really good. Also, the Giants were like the third team in the NFL. I took a screenshot of this. The Giants, uh, in terms of their first preseason week one, number of players held out of the preseason. Giants had 31 players. The most in the NFL was the Rams with 38. And the Giants were like the fourth team that the fourth the fourth highest number of guys that they left out of the preseason. I said that very wrong. The Jets only left out 12. So a lot of, you know, about a third of the Giants roster right now didn't even see the field uh, preseason game week one. I mean, who was the most important, if you count out the offensive line, who was the most important player that played? Was it Darius Slayton? You could even argue it was Aziz. Darnay Holmes played a little bit. He was, he's in, he was a starter last year. Tay Crowder. Um, Julian Love, he was third on the team in tackles last year. He was out there, but yeah, that's yeah. I mean, they didn't like they it. didn't they didn't play. You know, um, like Darius Slayton being out there at the offense is like, oh wow. But it was kind of like, hey, like John Ross isn't playing, Kadarius like yeah. Kadarius isn't playing. Shep's not going to play, and then obviously Galladay's not. Yeah, but besides uh, those guys, not really anybody like, and the offensive line. That's yeah, it. the offensive line, like very real. Like, let's see what it looks like. That was those were those guys were out there playing and and. You can have real opinions on them, but um, the the rest of the starters really didn't play much. And it's like you know, Tay Crowder, he's kind of built to be next to Blake. So that's the rookie report. Do you want to talk about the running back room next? Um, can we? Can we? Oh include... no, you want to talk about Raymond Johnson because he yeah. played awesome. Yeah, I, I was like, can we include in the rookie report our our last undrafted guy, which is Raymond Johnson, who I think in the run game maybe struggled a little bit, but he there was one play that he made on the on a ball carry in the run game uh, where he combined with another guy. So Raymond Johnson really had the the play that just impressed me the most outside of Carter Coughlin and outside of David Sills and Sandro Platzkummer, but. He gets basically double teamed and he puts an offensive guard on his ass. And this is when Zach Wilson is still out there, by the way, puts a guard on his ass on a third down and gets a QB hit. It's, you know, it winds up being a check down. The Jets go for it and they don't get it. But it was just really cool to see him go after the quarterback from the inside, by the way. 
from the inside wearing that number 91. I feel like that's kind of cool. You kind of have some, you got to have some balls to wear a number 91 in a Giants uniform and be a pass rusher. I know how we feel about numbers and it, it doesn't matter, doesn't not matter, blah, blah, blah. But he looked good. And this is a guy that was our favorite undrafted free agent because of his strength. The dude is strong and he showed it kind of early on in the preseason. So I hope he makes the team. I really do. He might. I mean, they carried six last year and just kept RJ McIntosh on the, you know, as the scratches. Because, I mean, who the guys, there's five guys who are going to make the team from that group Leonard, Dex, obviously, Shetland, Austin Johnson, and BJ Hill. Those five guys are basically locks, but they kept RJ McIntosh around and it was a healthy scratch in all 16 games. So, you know, Raymond Johnson is a new player, someone they might want to hold on to, maybe not to play this year and don't want him to get snagged by another team. But uh, which, by the way, Danny Shelton looked good. Now oh, yeah. there was some reps where it's like, okay, this is where he's not Dalvin, you know, where he gets doubled and he and he's not, he doesn't have any, he does, he really is just not effective in the pass game. He can push the pocket back sometimes, but he's not, he's just not effective in the pass game. But that I mean that fourth down tackle, there there was just plays where it's like this guy just demolishes blocks, like he just he just throws centers to the side sometimes. So um. That was good. Yeah, but it was it was good to see that out of Raymond from, you know, game one. You know, his last yep. game was at Georgia Southern, and now he's you know in the NFL making some plays. Like he he, I was watching him a little bit too, and he looked good. Circling back to one of my players to watch, I'm actually going to talk on. We'll, we'll talk on both of them. One of my players to watch for on Friday's pod was Nico Lelos. He looked pretty solid. Got some run stops, got some QB hits, and he played relatively early too. I feel like My he was worry with, with that. Nico is he's going to look good versus bad players, but he'll never look good versus good players. Yeah, yeah, but I, I don't, I, I like to just say if a guy looked good, I'm not going to give the, the like low hanging fruit of oh well it was against backups. Like that's a given. Like understand that when we say that guys look good, it's not like we're saying they're going to be the next right. uh, you know Hall of Famer player. But he looked good, and he was a player that I said to look out for, and I'm glad that he showed out. And my second player that I said to watch for was Corey Clement. So let's talk about the running back room. Yeah, um, Clement had the fumble, and you just can't fumble when you're RB three. In the red zone. (laughs) He's at, yeah, on first and goal. And he's had six fumbles and 200 touches, which I did look at this before the podcast, though. And this is kind of why I hate doing the instant reaction videos. um, Because it's like you can't really give your full thoughts. Devontae Booker hasn't been no saint when it comes to fumbles either, though, in his career. Hmm. Like, you go go look at his career, and he's got some fumbles himself. Um, But you just can't have those fumbles. And I don't think Booker looked bad. There was one rep where it was like, ah, oh, Booker, you could have you could have made something out of that. But Clement definitely looked better as a runner. Like Clement was even when the hole was closing down, he like shimmied through a couple. He looked better, but the fumble that is gonna mean something, especially with with Joe Judge as the coach. And it's a shame because I thought this before the game and now I'm I'm thinking it now. And I thought it before the game because of the reports that were coming out of practice. I trust the beat reporters, okay? I don't trust them with my life when it comes to the practice reports, but I do trust them because I trust their eyes and what they're seeing and I'm not seeing it. Corey Clement is flat out just a more exciting running back than Devontae Booker. Booker right. is more of just your prototypical backup that's going to come in and he's going to be efficient and he's going to do a little bit of everything kind of well. Clement is more exciting where he kind of gives you a little bit more of a big play boost and he's going to be a little bit more faster, a little bit more explosive. And I want to see more of Clement. I know he fumbled, and but really when he came in is when the offense started to churn, start churning a little bit. I also find it to be very funny that in preseason football when quarterbacks are as bad as they were with both the Jets and the Giants uh, on Saturday, that running the ball was more efficient than throwing the ball, which I don't think I've ever – watched a, a, a football game in my life this includes high school i've ever watched a football like a football game in my life where running the ball was more efficient than throwing the ball i have but yeah clement definitely <laughs> looks faster um and you know he was like it wasn't ne- it, it was good block plays but it wasn't like it wasn't like oh look he just walked you know a mac truck could have made it through this hole like he was making some plays it, it is a shame that it gets overshadowed by that fumble because if he doesn't fumble it's it's Corey Clement day on, on social media too. Yep. You know, it's like Will Hernandez, David Sills, Carter Coffin, Corey Clement. But the fumble, it just kind of leaves a black cloud over it. 
I, so with that fumble, I would say a bad day overall for the running back group. I mean, Alfred Morris had two carries for negative four yards, and unless unless you're a little scat back from Austria, it was uh, it was oh, not. Oh yeah, like he had a good night. Oh yeah, our friend. I can't tell you. There were like a couple times I screamed during the game. One was before the game, after the national anthem, where I said, "Your Let's... voice sounds like you screamed the whole game." Oh no, I, I was only no only three times I screamed. I can't scream as much as I used to. Where I said I screamed before the game after the national anthem, like let's hit someone. Football's a contact sport, you know. It's, you know, it's about hitting someone. So I got excited that football was just going to be here because I knew Hell's Bells was coming. And then the second time was San Joe Platzcomer, where I and this wasn't even the big play. I didn't know that he was in, but then I saw that the ball was in his hands, and I screamed, "Sandro!" <laughs> So I really, I just loved, I just like seeing him and the fact that he broke off that big run and I did a sign and I not, I didn't do this to troll, but I did it to kind of be a little bit of, not even a jerk, but exaggerate my Giants fandom as I did a side-by-side comparison of Saquon Barkley's big run against the Browns, his first preseason game, and then Sandro Platzcomer's big run on the right sideline against the Jets. And you know what? They look pretty damn similar to me. Sandro, Sandro RB3. I mean, Clement fumbles. Alfred Morris is old. I love Devontae Alfred Booker's starts. boring. Sandro's yeah. fun. Sandro, Sandro for RB3. So that was cool for him. And he's you know our what? friend. And, and so. I know he's, he's part of this international program, and he probably never will be on an official roster. But I do think, like, like that's a huge moment in his life. Oh, yeah. Having that, that run. Like, you know, Sandro, like, that, I, I was very happy for him to get that run. He's shifty too, by the way. Like it's he not, is. it's not like he just, wa- you know, just fell into a big run. Like he's a shifty dude. He's, I just, I'm not gonna take anything away from him. Good job, Sandro. I'm, 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 I was very excited for him. Big moment for our friendship, uh, Sandro Platzcomer and I. You know, ever since I told him that Ronnie Barnes joke about him and also him becoming the team doctor, we've been great friends ever since. So it's also a big moment for our friendship. And um, yes. Oh, he had, he's keeping up that reputation of being a like forty yard per carry guy that he was in Austria. He's keeping yeah, up that, that reputation is true. in the NFL. Let's see, he averaged twelve point like eight yards per carry. <sighs> My man can run the ball. There you go. Anything else before I read the next ad? Um, Bobby Skinner, Fetty Odenabo got snaps late. Which let's, I thought. I bet you we'll talk about a Fetty next week. Let's say let's let's not talk. Let's sports managers worldwide is the global leader in online sports business education. We teach people how to work on the business side of sports. All of our classes are taught by industry professionals. Your mentors have been in the game you want to work in and done the jobs you want to do. SMWW has had graduates work for all thirty-two NFL teams, including Patrick Hanscom, who is an area scout for the Giants. SMWW can train you to be an agent, a scout, work in the front office, work in, work in the film with digital video editing tool XOS Thunder used by all 32 teams. Learn from people uh, like former Tampa Bay GM Mark Dominic, football analytics gurus Aaron Schatz and Mike Tanner of Football Outsiders. Learn the skills and knowledge you need to know to work in football at all levels and turn your dream into reality. They may not be able to teach Danny Dimes to finish out his 80-yard run against the Eagles, but they can teach you to work in football. They keep on throwing that dig in at us every time. Like, I love this product. Leave Daniel Jones alone. No, we. this honestly might be my favorite ad we've ever done is this company. Apply free at smww.com and use the discount code GIANTS for $50 off the course of your choice. They offer courses in football, baseball, basketball, soccer, and more. If you have always dreamed of a job working in sports, sports management worldwide can help you. From sports betting to esports, sports broadcasting. Hey, maybe I should take a course. They have they have the what you know and who you know to get you into the game. Discount code GIANTS. All right. I, I'm sorry for cutting you off on Afedi, but no, I just feel like... that's that's okay because uh, that was actually my last note. Like, Afedi Odenabo getting snaps pretty late in the game like he was out there and like later in the, in the latter part of the second half like after Nico Lelos and he was getting snaps with Nico Lelos I'm glad that Afedi looked good and I'm glad that he made some tackles for loss and he had some pressures but if there's one guy where I'm gonna have that point of it's expected that he does that because he's going up against backups that's the guy so that's the last note that I actually had about everything right all right um <sighs> Anything we need to catch up on. So now that we are in like full mode, it's like we can't BS at the beginning of episode, so we we save it at the end for yeah. or we talk about whatever you want. And that was good. We we're doing pretty good on time. Yeah. 
yeah i mean what Fan Fest again, I know we've talked about it a ton, but was it was a lot of fun. I, I really enjoyed that. Man, I feel like I should have written it down. I feel like there's something I wanted to say. Had some people come up uh to me and parking lot K. I appreciate everybody making the trek. Um uh, my buddy Justin, um, who was in section I forget what section I was in. I wasn't in three fifteen. I moved I moved to the fourth quarter to the other side of the stadium in the three hundreds and my buddy Justin caught me in the act dancing to New York Groove. The first time hearing New York Groove since the end of 2019, and I was acting like a fool and dancing like a fool, and he captured it, and it was really, really cool. Um, took a picture with him, which was nice. Yeah, but it, it's cool to be back, Bobby. It's just great to be back. It's great to be back in the stadium, and I actually, I'm actually thinking about giving my tickets away. Not on air. I'm sorry. I'm not probably gonna get. I'm gonna give them away to somebody that I know. Um, because I don't, I don't think I want to go again before the regular season. I think I just want to save the feeling and save the like excitement yeah i mean it, it looked like it was actually no it didn't that game was really boring <laughs> it, was, um, it was a boring game but if it was any other preseason game where let's say like there's no COVID and we go to giants games last year then i definitely think i have a different vibe this show where it's like yeah that game was boring and it stunk but it wasn't sloppy uh, the game really wasn't sloppy i guess and maybe it's just me not seeing football in a really long time and just being happy to be there but yeah my friends and my buddies that i was with they were like that game sucked and i'm like no i was like i was there and i I was excited so giants football it's back it's pseudo back and then we're gonna say that it's back again week one and be excited i have an announcement i will be paying 40 dollars extra for every single flight for the rest of my life i paid for the emergency aisle and i am i am it's definitely worth it being at six foot seven. I I would agree with that. And I've never done it. I've always been a cheap ass, but I I will always pay that forty dollars for the rest of my life. I think it's it very worth it. Yeah. I didn't realize the big. I I always knew it had more legroom. I never knew the difference that it had though. Like it is, it is the difference of being comfortable and extremely uncomfortable. It's the difference of enjoying whatever entertainment you're listening to or watching on the airplane and just like counting down the minutes till it's over. Even though I am always counting down the minutes till my flights are over. You're also a man who I would very much trust pulling the emergency whatever cord you got to pull. I oh, trust yeah, I you. Definitely, I would definitely help the people out um, doing that. Also, oh, I'm thinking about cutting my hair off. All of it? Yeah. That'll be a drastic like difference. I know, but we'll I'm just thinking to, about doing it. We'll be back to early last summer if we do that. I'm I'm just I'm just kind of over it. It's a pain in the ass. Um, we've been getting some one star reviews that yeah, that kind of sucks. Let's I mean, it's usually it's like okay, we get a one star review here and there, but it's like three of our last like seven reviews are one stars. Can that I really read them? Sucks. I I actually think some of them are funny and they're technically not wrong. So you ready for this? Sometimes funny, mostly babble, easily the worst Giants pod. I mean, not wrong. That and, when someone says that though, that means they're from another Giants podcast. And Justin is clearly like if you say a, we're the worst one. You're from another Giants podcast. Fifty years a Giants fan is the person's nickname. Um, Justin Which just means you're an asshole. Probably. Justin is clearly a virgin, and Bobby's body is weird. That is like rude, but not wrong. But you know what's funny about that is that person went to our fan fest and was there and and sh- and shut his mouth like a, a a quiet little church mouse. What a, he's an old, I don't want to say the P word on the podcast, but that's what he is. Get me a bucket and I'm mop. Yeah. That's what 50 years of Giants, you're 50, 50 years a, a P word. That's what you are. No, the, the, that person's nickname was no Zay with a bunch of A's. No Zay. Yeah. So. He is no Zay. Refresh your five stars so we can get rid of, the, get flush those one stars out but honestly it's the support has been great and i can't share it on the podcast but i did have some i had some people say good job and it was unprovoked and it made me feel like it's honestly it was a cooler moment to me than the joe judge thing at the senior bowl so i that made me feel good said it to you specifically well you weren't there he he said but he you know he's talking about talking giants so that made me that made me feel amazing um and, and, and honestly, it's now it's like if anyone says something like "you suck," it's like you know what? I'm all right. I'm at least I'm at least a little all right. Um, so so that was nice. All right, that's that's an episode. One final note. 
Leonard Williams, number 84 on the NFL top 100, and I couldn't be more proud. Yeah. But Giants don't have a top 10 secondary. Shut up, Warren Sharp. All right, we appreciate you guys. We'll be back for a regular pod on Friday. I think Zach Rosenblatt's – or no, I think Dan Duggan might be coming on. Okay. Um, To talk about the joint practices uh, in Cleveland. So we'll be back on Friday. All the PPPs within the middle of that. We appreciate you guys. We'll see you then. Until then, let's go Big Blue.